With us today, we have Kalyan Krishna, who's going to talk to us about some principles of zero trust for developers. But before he gets started, uh, uh, let him introduce himself. Just a little bit of, of logistics. This is a public call that we host every third Thursday of the month. So thank you for joining us. We are going to record this call and then we're going to publish it on YouTube. So you can find it in the URL listed on, on your screen. Or you can follow us uh, on the Twitter accounts listed there, and then you'll see notifications about this. Our next call will then be on January 20th. All right. So I don't want to take too much time. I'm going to let uh, Kalyan introduce himself, but please uh, let's have an engaging conversation, be friendly. And if you have any questions or comments, please uh, feel free to type them in the chat. Or if you want to mute yourself, uh, it's better if you can raise your hand and then Kalyan will um, ask you to comment. All right. Thank you so much, Kalyan. You can take it over from here. Hey, thank you, Stephen, again. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Kalyan Krishna. I'm a program manager in the Microsoft Identity Division focused on uh, developer experiences and uh, essentially guiding developers and independent software developers uh, and vendors who are integrating with various features of our platform, including Microsoft Graph. In this particular session, we will be presenting a kind of an introduction to Zero Trust, which is essentially uh, a more or less an IT probe focused uh, initiative for developers as well. There is a part that developers play to make sure that an organization or the Zero Trust Initiative in general succeeds uh, for, a, for an organization, for an Azure AD tenant. And uh, we would basically fish it out. Uh, we will tell you what is your responsibility as a developer to uh, help developer integrate your apps in a, in a manner where when Zero Trust policies and Zero Trust initiatives are rolled out in an organization, uh, you do not fail the IT uh, for folks who are trying to roll out these policies. So. We will essentially uh, quickly uh, go through the uh, introduction of what Zero Trust is, uh, and then essentially we would immediately jump into why should a, a developer care about Zero Trust, and uh, then we would provide you with some prescriptive guidance on uh, what as a developer are your responsibilities uh, uh, to take care of when you're developing what we are now referring to as a Zero Trust Ready app. And then we'll provide you with a lot of links and, and, and resources that you can go to learn, to learn and basically start making those changes or implementing those uh, guidelines uh, with your application and development processes. So let's start with what Zero Trust is. So uh, the first questions that that we always, uh, we almost always get when, when we speak about Zero Trust to developers is like, we are, I'm already doing all of these security related exercises in my in my in my development process. I am doing threat modeling. We have code reviews. We have penetration testing. There is an entire security development lifecycle that we follow. So why should we care about these things? And and you're you're partly there uh, quite right is because if you have following these uh, zero trust is not essentially a replacement of these things. So zero trust probably probably would be called a, a referred to as a subset of what uh, the security fundamentals that are, that are in practices. So one way to look at this session also is that uh, we are going to basically highlight those uh, those practices in the security fundamentals that are more specific to Zero Trust. Uh, maybe you're doing all of them today and you don't need to do anything, but if you are not, uh, we, will, we will basically be trying to explain how it is more important, how why it has become more important today and why you should be paying more attention than you have. So we are, again, it's a re-evaluation. There is still a lot out there in terms of applications that organizations and customers use, where you simply an application within a within a network boundary like a like a you know a, a corp networks is simply implicitly trusted, and those kind of uh, trusts are increasingly being abused by attackers to carry out uh, different kinds of breaches. And zero trust essentially is uh, trying to push away from this culture of implicit trust that the industry and and, and the developers had basically come to rely, uh, rely on to move away from there and go to a, 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 a culture where you are looking for explicit verification for everything that happens with your app and every operation that your applications carry out. So we have an important role to play as a developer to uh, build applications which are zero trust ready 
And now I'll just basically quickly cover the zero trust principles, what zero trust is. So zero trust is essentially a set of three principles. The first principle is called verify explicitly. Uh, this is where the the developer's role is actually becoming more and more important. As I said, uh, any anybody who has uh, developed an application or works with an application that has an implicit trust built into it, just because it is hosted in a certain network environment, has to start looking from, hey, do I really know who is calling my app? Who is the user of my application? Who is carrying out these operations? So this is where uh, the zero trust says, hey, you should always authenticate and authorize based on all available data points like users, who is the application, what is the device, where is this application running, uh, where is the user that is using the application based on what is the health of the device, is it a device that is compliant, so on and so forth. And on top of it, a lot of work is actually done by the identity providers here, like Azure Active Directory, who will also use their AI, ML, and identity protection uh, algorithms to uh, make sure that the caller has uh, is not a compromised one and, and, and your, your application is basically used by a secure system. The next one is called use least privilege access. Um, not exactly a brand new thing. Those of us who have worked with uh, uh, role-based access security or worked with security groups and, and app roles, uh, essentially you are uh, ensuring that uh, you, when, when, a, when a user or an application accesses a resource and you are making sure that they are given just enough permissions to do what they are supposed to do. Basically, we are advising zero trust advisors that you should move from this catch-all scenario where uh, everybody has access to maybe everything or, or or you are like looking at things very broadly in terms of hey if i give them access to all of these certain resources they might just be able to succeed to basically develop a culture where uh, we will be looking at just in time just enough access uh, where which reduces the scope of abuse that by a certain user and application we will discuss this in more detail how re how it really translates for developers uh, in, in in the later slides Finally, this is something that uh, uh, third principle is called assume breach. Is it some? This is actually something quite new uh, for developers. I'm not saying you you don't know about what breaches are, but a, a lot of development process do not necessarily are are built to work with the assumption that breaches will happen, and it's an application. And there are there are certain responsibilities that a developer has to carry out to make sure that the once, once a breach happens to their application, the data that their application handles, the, the, there should be a way to quickly recover, find out what 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 is the extent of damage. And this is uh, one of the areas which I have found is like uh, sometimes surprises developers because it's not something that most developers uh, have a habit of you know, automatically thinking about. Yes, there are some, uh, you know, in Azure AD and in much, much of Microsoft, we definitely cover this, we have been covering this for years, but in the general, uh, developer ecosystem uh, out there. Uh, this is something that, that surprises developers, and this is where uh, we are trying to uh, build this culture and incubate this culture is where developers should think about, hey, uh, irrespective of all the steps that I take, all the steps that an IDP will take, all the steps that uh, any third party provider or system or process that you have built will take, there might be a chance that my application will be breached. Is, am I ready for it? Am I able? Is it is it possible for my application to quickly recover? And this is what uh, Azure Breach asks you to look into. So, when you look into when you start your journey with Azure AD, uh, remember this: uh, there is a lot of work that goes into providing, you know, uh, successfully implementing zero trust, and irrespective of whether you work with Azure AD or any other identity provider, a lot of this work will be provided out of the box by the identity provider themselves. So I have picked up just one example, which is our identity protection. A lot of this verify explicitly, least privilege access and, and things of that, that zero trust principles are provided out of the box. You, as a developer, you don't have to worry about it. There are a lot of questions we get is like, hey, all of this is already provided. Why should I care about developers? Yes, we understand that. Uh, there is the, the there is a lot of heavy lifting that uh, IDPs will do it for you, but then again there are aspects that again we will cover quickly where uh, it's your responsibility as well and uh, and and there is not you're not really completely out of the hook on this one. Today, as we produce more and more documentation, more and more guidance on on zero trust and how Azure Active Directory and my Azure in general should be protected or, or our customers, your resources, your data should be protected with the uh, zero trust principles. Uh, we are advising, we have provided, generated, uh, provided a lot of guidance to the IT pros out there to roll out zero trust in their organization. So what happens is that the need for uh, 
developers and IT pros to work together is a key thing that should be understood when you are working towards uh, making your application zero trust ready. So while the bulk focus will remain on an IT professionals, uh, they would be doing things like enforcing MFA for applications or, uh, you know, creating IP address ranges to block uh, traffic from or uh, enforcing uses of compliant devices. These are not something that requires developers to do anything in their app. But uh, there are certain things that require you to, to, as a developer, to take care of because not all of the things that IT pros need to do will uh, to, to implement zero trust will succeed unless you, as a developer, uh, take some of them. So let's take some examples, okay? So the, the first thing that, that comes to my mind every uh, when, when we look, look at this is credential hygiene. So what happens is uh, when, when a breach happens, one of the first things that an IT admin wants to do is that they want to be able to quickly rotate your secrets and certificates. So if you are not using Key Vault and your application is not really built for it, uh, the, they have to basically come to you and ask you to do so, maybe uh, do a redeployment. We don't want that. You should be looking at developing your applications in a way where an IT pro, an IT admin or department can actually go and when they detect some kind of a breach, they should be able to rotate your credentials, uh, you know, compromise credentials without your involvement. And this is uh, one of the most common areas. So have you built your app to prepare those things, you know, handle credential retention? Yes or no, because if you haven't, the IT, pro, uh, the IT admin would actually fail. The second one is uh, we have step up authentication, CAE, and some features which require our applications to specifically add support in them. Uh, not all of them, some of these can be in for server side like MFA, but there are some like step up authentication that we will, that requires you to write some code on, on your side to handle it. Otherwise, uh, all, all of these uh, efforts from IT would not really succeed fully. Similarly, as more and more data access, uh, visibility in, in data access is, is, is uh, coming up, like, you know, oh, we are building features where an, app, where an IT admins or IT pros can, IT departments can see what kind of permissions is held by which kind of applications, what kind of data they are accessing, what kind of changes to data they are doing. Uh, the, uh, the IT admins are becoming, so, so the IT departments are becoming slowly very careful about what kind of permissions they consent to. So in this case, if you have not built your application to basically work with the least amount of permissions that your app needs to succeed, you will find that the, the, the adoption of your application will slowly become harder and harder. So there are other things like uh, legacy protocols and APIs. So if you are, your application is using some protocols, which like you know basic authentication that we are advising IT uh, tenant admins to switch off, you will see more problems with uh, uh, your application being adopted in this environment as well. Going forward, so as I basically, the, the, not all policies can be can be implemented unless developer supported. You need to help the IT pros is because you need to uh, this this initiative is because uh, if you if you work together, if you support uh, some of these things that we are asking you to do uh, in, with, your, with your applications, you would uh, minimize the probability of you know compromises happening and most importantly, quickly respond when an attack is in play, is, is underway, and uh, basically reduce damage by saving your data, uh, taking your system offline, quickly recover, and get your user, users back in the business. So, as a developer, when you, when you just had your app in in, a, in your in your own environment, it was just about you and your app, and 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 if if things go went went bad, it's just your app that that basically was was at risk. What is happening is when you when you deploy your application in in a cloud infrastructure like Azure. Uh, the attackers are basically using one weak app to make you know move laterally through the system. It's not just if somebody has compromised your client secret or or, or certificate, they would just have be able. They probably would only and only damage or uh, hurt things that your application is a, is is uh, is responsible for. Those those can be used for uh, the, the attackers. Actually, the attackers are using it to uh, move laterally through the systems, compromise other apps, and so on and so forth. So your system, uh, your cloud infrastructure is as only as secure as the weakest link, and you don't want your app to be the weakest link here. So we'll talk about this uh, zero trust readiness in in more detail. Uh, before we stop for a question, I just wanted to call out that. Uh, this is this, this guidance that we are going to provide here is essentially for developers who are integrating with our identity platform. Uh, this is a good slide that explains the general 
uh, features and libraries, endpoints, and and user accounts that uh, that basically comprise the identity platform. Uh, uh, our guidance is is uh, is is just going to be limited to those 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 apps. Uh, there is a lot out there that you can do as well, but uh, it's not generally that we would cover in this session and and the documents and uh, guides that we will make available for you. I'm going to take a uh, break here. Sorry, I went through it very fast because I wanted to uh, get to the guidance part of it as soon as possible. Uh, but uh, let's take a break and see how many questions we have out there. Uh, Stephen. Uh, would you be able to look at a few for me? Yeah, definitely, Kalyan. So the first question that I see is from Sahil. Uh, why continuous access evaluation is not available for apps registered by developers? As Azure ID doesn't provide introspect endpoints, the JOT token is self-contained bearer and cannot be revoked at will. Uh, it is available. I'm going to just cover it in a minute. It's actually the next topic that I will. This is the most important bit that we want to cover here. Sahil, if you could hold your questions till I finish up and then I'll stop again and and and, and we'll check if, if that, that we got to answer your question. OK, and then the next one is a comment from Eric. Even if you're using Key Vault for storage support rotation, the way you reference the Key Vault is critical. If you use uh, Key Vault references in your config setting, you will need to reference a known version secret. That's right. When the secret is updated, it can take up to 24 hours to have your app pick up the new version. This can be forced by updating any settings in the config. We use a dummy setting and a function trigger on the event to force this updated. Okay, I'm assuming Eric is providing some good advice here on how to actually effectively use the key vault for and, and rotate, so rotate the secrets out there. Uh, Thanks. I, I don't see a question here, so thanks. Yeah, Eric. and and that's all, Italian, so far. Okay, cool. So we get to the meat of the session: how to make your app zero trust ready. Before we go forward, I go forward on this path. Uh, just remember, this is that the zero trust implementation is is not it's, it's not done. The guidance is still evolving. We are learning new things. Attacks keep happening. Uh, the attackers find new ways to to compromise systems, and we keep learning. We keep updating these this guidance. So one of the things that you should notice is like, yes, there is a set of guidance that you will get us from today. You will incorporate some or most of it in your in your development life cycles, but please check back, let's say, you know, six months, a year from now as well, because things will uh, would have updated a little bit more depending upon how many places or how many ways, how many new ways attackers will find a way to compromise systems, uh, especially in the in the cloud ecosystem. Uh, one place where you should be, uh, you should have bookmarked is essentially our uh, zero trust guidance center. We have a specific uh, uh, section on there, just just focused on developers. Uh, this is the link here. I will drop the entire deck in the chat window for anybody to share uh, to basically refer to. There are a lot of links here, and we want you to go through them uh, and and uh, keep yourself updated. Uh, there is a a developer guide which is essentially a set of uh, steps that developers can take with Microsoft Identity Platform. Uh, and, and, and those are in the in, in this guide here that uh, we have provided a link again. Uh, we will be covering some of the steps that we have advised you in the in the developer guide uh, in this particular session. But if you want the entire set, please download the ebook and, and uh, go through all of it. OK, let's move on. So. From the prescriptive guidance, we will not be able to cover everything. So we have picked up a set of things that we believe are the most important, the most critical ones that developers should pay attention to. So we will basically start with some uh, general prescriptive guidance for uh, applications in general. Then we'll cover the continuous access evaluation in a bit of a detail. I was, uh, and then a small set of guidance for those of you who are building more mobile applications that authenticate with Azure AD. And then we will discuss uh, least privilege for apps and APIs. If you are a web API developer, you should uh, definitely pay attention to this. And then we'll talk a little bit about credential hygiene and how uh, to basically enrich your uh, logging or telemetry uh, using some of the data that Azure already provides you in tokens and such. And then uh, some uh, pre prescriptive advice on how to quickly recover from breach. Again, uh, there is a much comprehensive list of things that we are hoping developers would uh, pay attention to. The developer guide covers them all. This is a very small subset. Okay, 
So the guidance that we will provide here, we have broken it, uh, kind of divided it into the under the three principles. Not everything actually fits one principle really. Not every uh, guidance fits one, just one principle usually, but uh, let's not get uh, very uh, pedantic about it and uh, move on. If you are working with Azure AD in general, uh, much of the features or near features that we are developing, uh, especially to address uh, zero trust uh, scenarios, are available to applications who use OpenID Connector or OAuth 2, or if you are using an, uh, the ADAL or the MSAL, especially the MSAL library. Uh, those of you who have not really very familiar with the whole idea of a modern authentication protocol. So modern authentication protocol, they're like, you know, SAML is actually a modern authentication protocol, but unfortunately it's kind of closed. So most of our, our changes are essentially dry, uh, riding on the OpenID Connector OAuth 2. Uh, so if if you are using uh, these two protocols, you would find it much easier to ingest things like continuous access uh, evaluation, auth context, and all the new things that we have. We have a lot of new things lined up uh, to make your application more secure, more zero trust compliant. But uh, uh, they are, uh, I would say, uh, kind of unfortunately, we have not been able to push it to other protocols. Uh, they will only be available for if you are using these two. Um, again, uh, also the fact is that uh, these two protocols keep evolving. There is an active community out there which is uh, adding new things to this protocol, and, and that basically makes things uh, easier for us to build a newer features and enroll it out to you. So it's something that you should consider very carefully. Uh, that uh, uh, if your application needs to, you know, be super zero trust compliant in the modern world, it's probably a good time to look into the MSA libraries and uh, and the, and or or basically any third party library that is a uh, OAuth two and OpenID Connect compliant. MSA libraries, one quick slider, they're available uh, for various platforms. Uh, if you use them, you are basically gonna cut out cut off uh, cut out your work by you know, factor of hundreds. There is so much that we automatically do for you. They're available for various platforms. Uh, please have a look. Uh, try try our code sample. See if you can uh, give it a shot and 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 make work a lot easier for you. The other aspect that you should also understand is that as things evolve, as we add new features, uh, MSALs will will be updated to ingest them automatically. So all you have to do is to keep updating the library. Let's say every six months. And you are your application just by doing that your application gets a lot of our good uh, goodness just out of the box. So uh, here is some example. They actually uh, other than the identity provider Azure AD itself, the MSALs actually do a lot of heavy lifting for you as well. And uh, if if you're not doing if you're not using a standard library, then you're probably looking at a lot of work out on your plate to do to take care of. Okay, so. And let's talk about continuous access evaluation. So this has become the key, a key feature in our zero trust strategy. So let me introduce it again. So one of the problems that we found that we are addressing with CAE, or uh, as, as we refer to it in, in general, is that we had a lot of issues with applications working or still having active sessions after a user account was revocated or disabled, or if the user was actually asked to change the password because uh, an identity protection system found that they had been compromised or their location had changed from let's say a corp to a, a more a not so secure a wi-fi location or they had been marked as a risky user because we found that their account was being misused so in those cases um, we decided that uh, we will build the system ca c is all about raising events it raises events and send it sends it to applications the applications are supposed to essentially then reject anything that they have cached for this user. So one example is that you sign in a user, you get a token for Microsoft Graph or Azure REST API. Now these tokens have a lifetime. They're uh, valid from one hour to 24 hours, depending upon how, about how, the, how things are set up in a tenant. What if the user has their account compromised and they're marked as risky? Your application is still using that valid Microsoft Graph token to carry out operations on behalf of this user. And this is the primary problem that we are trying to solve with CAE among some, some other things. Now, the challenge with this is that we cannot just reject the valid token just like that because it will break millions of applications that were built before CAE came along. As a developer, 
you have to explicitly add support for CAE in your app. Now, CAE is a topic in itself, and I hope to do a, a detailed session with a demo uh, one day. But for now, if you are interested, uh, there is uh, something about making your application uh, what we refer to as a capable client, and then use uh, CAE, uh, start to basically react to CAE events. Uh, this is a, a good example of how CAE works behind the scenes. So let's say you are a CAE-capable client, which is your application. Okay, your application. If you're using the MSL library, uh, you would not. This is abstracted, but let's say you know about refresh tokens and access tokens. So, like a, for every certain after a certain interval, you will basically send the refresh token to Azure AD, and Azure AD will give you a new access token. Then you send it to a resource provider like Microsoft Graph, and things just work out. But if you when you tell Azure AD that you are a CAE capable client, Azure AD when it sees that one of those events that I had listed, you know, user account disabled, revoked, will actually tell Microsoft Graph that uh, there is an application out there with a token for a user who has been found to be risky. In this case, when your application sends this access token to Microsoft Graph, which is, and this is a, still a valid access token, Microsoft Graph will reject this seemingly valid access token. In those cases, your application, now you have done one thing, which you have declared yourself to be CA capable client, your application has done so, uh, you actually will get a certain type of exception that we have documented uh, here in the AKMS claims challenge. And you're supposed to redirect the user back to Azure AD for further processing. So user, uh, Azure AD might ask the user to do an MFA or they might ask, uh, ask the user to change their password or might just block it if, if things cannot, uh, there is nothing to be done. But the idea here is that the user is now blocked from, uh, that user account cannot be used for any more attacks or explorer uh, vulnerabilities in a system. So I was hoping to do a CAE demo, but it actually takes quite a while. So, But we do have a, recorded uh, CAE demo uh, in this available in this particular link. If you could kindly type it, you should be able to go through it. It's a, it's about five minutes uh, or so, uh, and it, it will show you how it works for an application. So again, uh, once you have gone through the demo, just to tell you what as an app developer you need to change. Now I'm basically referring to a developer who is using .NET and uh, for now, uh, if you are, uh, using our identity web libraries, uh, uh, Microsoft MSA libraries, all you have to do in your application to declare yourself as capable of receiving, you know, handling CA events is to add this line of code in uh, your uh, configuration file. Uh, I know not all, all of you are familiar with it, but again, I, I'm repeating this. Go to the claims challenge uh, link that I had provided if you are if you want to understand how work, it works internally. But if you are using our libraries, all you have to do is to drop the client capability string here and in your code, uh, so this is a sample code where I'm using the Microsoft.NET Graph SDK to call the Microsoft Graph slash me endpoint. Uh, we see here that uh, if we receive this exception from Graph, which basically says continuous access evaluation resulted in a claims challenge, uh, you will use the Consent handler, again, it's a thing that is provided in the library itself to basically take the user back to Azure AD. So that's what the challenge user method does. There is, again, I stop here because there is a lot here, but generally you should, uh, if you're interested in exploring deeper how CAE works, please start with, uh, uh, if you want really deep, you can start with the claims challenge document and see how, how client capabilities and, and, and exceptions are essentially thrown at you. You can try this demo, you can try this sample to, to basically recreate that scenario. You can use a tool like Fiddler. I would advise that you use a Fiddler to actually see the challenge, how it flows through. If you don't want to do a whole lot and you just want to take care of it uh, as little code as possible because you're already using our libraries, small change in configuration, small change in your uh, exception handling, and you are good to go. You don't have to worry about how redirection happens and so on and so forth. All you care about is that, is that there is a new exception type with a message and there are a couple of uh, new classes that uh, will take care of this problem for you, uh, handling handling the CAE challenge. So I'm gonna stop here again and uh, just quickly go through some questions because this is actually the most important bit that we wanted to cover in this session and make sure that you are aware of it and you and as we hope you are basically up going to update your applications to support it and, uh, as we move along. So I know there is another topic that I'm supposed to move, but I'll just stop here for a second. Uh, 
Do we need to hard code the secret? No, you shouldn't. We do it in our samples, but in our samples, we also have a, a link in the bottom, which basically tells you how to deploy it in Azure. And in fact, in this particular sample here, we have shown you how to, uh, actually there is a demo that I'll share a link in the, in the, in the towards the end of this uh, session, where we show you how to move this, this secret from here to Key Vault and, and access it using manage, managed identity. Uh, but for for when, when samples are like you know we want the developers to start learning and and, and we want it to be a little uh, less frictionless. But uh, we definitely our our advice is that you should never keep any secret in a in a configuration file. Thanks for calling it out. Uh, so a question from Sahil is continuous actually if a token issued to a custom API with Azure AD. So here is the point. Uh, you, you have a, it's a very good question, Sahil. Today we have CA events ingressed by just Microsoft Graph and Azure REST API. By mid 2022, it should be available in some fashion for anybody. So if you are an API developer, you should be able to get uh, an event from Azure AD. Uh, you basically should be able to say, your application should be able to declare itself as a CAE capable server and start receiving events from Azure AD. Uh, maybe not mid 2022, but but some somewhere uh, in that year, but not today. Today it's more about hey, my application is a heavy user of uh, uh, Graph and or Azure APIs, and and I want to start basically taking those steps to make my application capable of handling these events. Uh, again, you can write this code; it doesn't hurt to be there. Tomorrow, if there are APIs, we support it, and the, a lot of these resources start uh, supporting CA and, and and rejecting tokens. You're already good for your application is is good for the future here. The question here is: Do you have any published guidance to use certificates instead of secrets? Uh, there, in the in the in the dev guide that I had uh, uh, provided a link for, we have a section describing why you should use it, how you should use it, and so on. But thank you for that comment about you know using demo as a best practice, Arc Eric. I'm just going to scroll a little bit further up. Okay, another one from Sahil is, is a company portal of a Microsoft Authenticator app required to be installed on the mobile to have SSO to all other apps installed on that mobile served by the same IDP? Yes, it is It is how it works. Uh, there is a lot to really get into it, but if you if you're using Authenticator and let's say there are 100 applications that are basically signing into that Azure AD tenant, uh, and and they are all using MSOL. Um, the the great thing is that the user you basically set up your account once with the Authenticator app, and that's it. You're done. Uh, every other app that basically is looking for uh, you to sign in will be, will go to Authenticator. Authenticator will uh, sign them up. I uh, just love the also the possibility of the user system application in a quarantine or elevate MFA factors in code and domain on the search engine conditional access. Will. Yeah, awesome. This is this is a, a actually a good. Uh, I'm sorry if I. Chittal Smith, uh, if I pronounce, uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name, but yeah, we this is a partnership between hey an application access being blocked because the Microsoft Identity Protection's AI and ML algorithms were able to find a risky scenario, and and uh, the uh, application developer support CA and, and was able to redirect the user to a point where they were able to carry out some kind of remediation. Great, um, moving on. There is the very interesting topic that I wanted to cover uh, in detail, uh, which is around the verify explicitly side of things. Is that uh, it's great if you trust Azure AD uh, that hey I integrated my app, I dropped MSL libraries, and awesome I get my authentication done, and the MSL library do, do a lot of other heavy lifting as well. But the principle of verify explicitly wants you to actually see if there are scenarios if your business needs if your authentication and authorization needs uh, basically put us uh, uh, need you to go a little bit further than simply implicitly trusting uh, the fact that azure ad was able to successfully authenticate a user again this might or might not apply to all of your application but you should be aware of the fact that you can actually uh, do much granular much deeper much uh, uh, clearer uh, decision making process if you are aware of what claims are provided in in like like in this case there is this is a sample id token from an application that's just authenticated a user and uh, we'll cover some of those maybe you need them maybe you don't but uh, be aware of it is because uh, there will be times when when this is something that you would probably want to use in your application once a user signs in to drive some or some or other business decisions uh, in case you're wondering, uh, the one of the claims that you should be aware is called audience. Uh, you should make sure 
just in case that uh, if you are uh, if you do a low level handling of tokens you should not be handling tokens which have an audience or an app id which is not your app uh, a lot of applications can authenticate with azure ad all of them get a token but your app actually, should not actually be that one can be avoided um so if you look at um federated workload identities microsoft are, are working on a, on a capability that would allow you to reach into our tenant with effectively an i manage identity which is then an identity on your side. So you wouldn't need an, an ID in secret in order to access the keys. Yes, that, that's manage identity for you. I, I'll cover it in, in, in a few minutes as well, just to. Yeah. Cool, oh, thank you. Uh, issuer is one of those claims that will, ISS is basically yeah, it's, issuer. Yeah, it's early days, but if you're still, if you're still sort of in planning phases for some of it, then the timelines may align. Okay, sure, thank you. Uh, sorry, before we discuss the claims in the token, if you're using MSAL or one of the libraries, usually the libraries will uh, discard the ID token and they will hydrate the claims in uh, uh, in, in some kind of a class or, or, a, or a base class. For example, if you're using ASP.NET, uh, these, these claims are essentially hydrated into what's referred to as a claims principle or HTTP context.current or dot .identity. They will be available to you, but not the token itself. But again, you can drive your 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 logic using the, the claims uh, that are available as well. So, yep, uh, audience is what tells you that this token was for your app. You can look at which tenant that the token was issued from. You can use security groups if you want to use them. Uh, Azure already has the capability to send these security group IDs that this user belongs to in the token itself, and you can use it to drive further decisions if needed. Name and preferred username, I, I call them out here, is because these can change. A lot of people think this is a primary key. It's not. They are not supposed to be treated. They are great for display purposes and such. Do not use them for primary keys. There is only and only one immutable identifier for a user account in an Azure AD tenant, and it comes to you in an OID. Yeah, I mean, we, we were just at the point of looking at how we would approach this at scale with automation when we found that the feature wasn't being delivered. So that, that kind of stopped us a bit because you know, we were looking at how we'd manage this for client level keys when we don't have that and we're sort of managing a key pair basically then obviously that changes how we yep. get to look at that yes there is there is some good discussion on this topic on the link that i've shared in the bottom AK does id tokens how to uh, uniquely identify a user there is also the subject claim but it has some nuances i will not cover it in this particular session but do read read about it in the id tokens uh talk out there great so yep that's the only mutable identifier uh when you use that again Applications can have app roles, great for RBAC. If you are using those, the roles would be given to you in the token itself. Again, the tenant where the operation took place is provided to you in tenant ID. This is something that you should also look at logging. Uh, you know, you can also get uh, the roles, the Azure RBAC roles or Azure AD roles as we call them in the token. They come in, in the WIDS claim. If you care about it, if the user is a global administrator or a app administrator, you can use it as well. And this, this information can be provided to you right in the token itself if you are if you are if your business needs are such. Now this was a token issued to what we refer to as a homed user. So user is actually homed in this particular tenant. Remember that your applications can also be signed in by guest users, users who are not homed in the tenant but are basically from some other tenant. In these cases, the tokens uh, there will be a claim called IDP, which will tell you where the user came from. So if you look at the issuer or the TID, where the operation is taking place, this is not where the tenant IDs are different. That's because the user came from a different tenant. This user is a guest in this particular tenant and is able to sign into your application. This is actually uh, something we want to highlight is because access to guest users sometimes stumped. Stumps developers is like, hey, why is this user signing in? This user is not even a member of my tenant. That's because users can be make, made guests. Actually, in reality, there are more guest users in most enterprise tenants than home users today. So if you have situations where you just want to make sure that you don't want to you want to treat guest users differently or you don't want to actually handle guest users at all, look for this claim. There is some more that's covered in ID tokens that you should also look into the ID tokens documentation. OK, uh, one topic that we continuously got some questions. We suggest if you are a mobile application developer, try to see if you can use MSOL. MSOL will automatically get uh, Authenticator app available uh, if, if, if it's already present on the device. It's really important because as IT policy enforcements are being 
done like things like uh, app protection policies passwordless device enrollment you don't want to have, get into those those uh, those uh, as a developer yourself this is something that you can easily offload today and uh, we advise you to basically see if you can support uh, the msl libraries and by, by and by extension the the authenticator app now uh, there is if you cannot do that at least uh, look into google's android uh, samsung and apple's documentation how to use the system web browser there is some some amount of uh, standardization that uh, is happening uh, that will get you through most of these uh, these uh, challenges that uh, your application will face if you're not using the msl library and authenticator not all of them the experience is not as smooth either but at least your application users will not be blocked uh, when 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 IT is rolling out all of these policies uh, for mobile applications and device compliance, stopping here again. Okay, uh, from Abdul Qadir, we have seen a lot of orgs logging login dot and being added to their proxy. So login happens from a corporate network, but app traffic itself will be coming from a local IP of the user. How CA affects? I don't have an answer right now, but I'm going to take a note uh, for this and see if, if we have some documentation available once it's available for developers out there. Uh, today it's not going to happen is because we are only the Azure it is only sending CA events to uh, Azure API and Microsoft Graph, but I understand that it will become a problem if, if we have a proxy and, and Azure AD needs to uh, cross that to send an event through. Uh, what is the serialization of token in MSAL? Uh, token bloat happens if you use security organization in larger. Yeah, we, we do have to balance that out. Uh, token bloat is there, but then again, we have a maximum token size. If you go and look for our uh, group uh, group sample, search for uh, using security group for with Microsoft Identity Platform or my Azure Active Directory. If, if, if there are uh, um, the number of groups is more than I think 150, we will not send you groups in the token. We actually send you a link to Microsoft Graph that your application needs to go through and get it so that the tokens don't really get bloated. Uh, groups and CAE are an issue. They only get refreshed every 20 years. Uh, that is true. Uh, yeah, you have a very good point. So using groups in a token uh, which is valid for 28 hours is 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 going to miss that. So I if if I were to do it, I will basically set up a notification for groups and, and rely on that. Uh, but I think it's a it's a binary choice in, in some ways, because uh, unless your application uses graph notifications, how are we supposed to tell you something that has been provided you in a bearer token has changed. So I suppose you would be, that's a good point to call out to for developers to be aware of that, uh, you know, valid tokens, tokens which are valid for 28 hours are, are gonna have some kind of a stale information, especially if you're looking at security group memberships. Uh, thanks for calling it out, Paul. Okay, uh, we will now go and uh, cover some of the some of the topics that come under the least privileged access uh, at this point, it looks like we'll go a little over the hour. So I'm going to just move a little faster and, and skip a couple of demos that I had planned. Uh, but uh, the first one is that if you're a web API developer, if you're not already doing it, you should be validating your access token using a standard validation SDK. It's a topic in itself. Uh, I would again suggest go look at our, our documentation, for example, the AKMS uh, validated tokens to make sure that your applications are doing it. If you have registered your application using Visual Studio, uh, you will then, and some of that code is generated. Uh, you don't have to really worry much about it because this is this code is generated automatically for you. But if you're not aware of what a token validation is, then you should be looking into some of this. Uh, there are scenarios where you would like to extend token validation as well. Uh, those are also things that uh, that uh, you might want to do once you are aware of what kind of claims show up in, in tokens in usual. Uh, this is another topic that uh, we will go through is if you're a web API developer and you provide access to data behind, behind the systems, there is some guidance that we want you to follow to make sure that IT pros or tenant admins when they are providing consent or access to applications that, that, that provide data via the web APIs, have have some amount of flexibility available, some 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 idea of how to handle risk here. So, for example, uh, if if I go back and uh, look into, uh, I wanted to share my screen, but uh, give me a second. Actually, let me share something. 
So here is a standard web API registration. If you look at it, it has just one scope. If you are familiar with uh, again uh, application registrations, you have registered a web API, you have been given an app ID URI, and usually by default we give you one one of these uh, scopes to get started with. Now this is okay to get started with, but this is not something that you want to take it to the to the to the IT admins really, it's because it's kind of a catch-all permission, and it creates problems for them. It's because they really don't know what level of if, data some somebody is good getting an access to so what we instead ask you to do is think through how you can help the it admins evaluate permissions uh, by giving them a set of scopes that basically convey some amount of uh, details and risk that uh, that each 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 one of these scopes contain so what happens is that uh, in these cases an IT admin has more flexibility they would love the idea that hey instead of one catch all permission you have given them some 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 granularity, some some flexibility in this term. So, look at Microsoft Graph permissions, for example. So you have user dot read basic, which basically tells the IT admin, okay, a very low privilege permission. All this application can do is just read some basic amount of information. User dot read write. Oops, this this application can now actually change data for this certain user dot read write at all. A very high privilege permission. I need to carry out more, you know, be more careful and be, you know, maybe take this application developer through a lot more uh, processes to make sure that uh, if this permission is given to them, to their app, uh, they, 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 are, they at least have uh, some some strong security fundamentals in this place. So this is this is something that uh, we want you to start looking into. It really, really helps the IT pro when um, they are. I guess the only... best yeah, sorry. alternative example I can cite is the um, Office 365 customer key. And with that, we use two Azure subscriptions with different people that have access to it and two separate you know, key vaults with different vault URIs. Um, the primary difference there is that, is that that system operates using two separate keys. And so you know, the, the keys are generated with, you know, from within Azure. Um, okay. But because they are two separate keys, we don't have the challenges with having to try and well, deal, with the, deal with the fact that you can't move those across regions. Who is it? So, uh, Mike, I'm not exactly familiar. Would you be kind enough to drop a link to that in the chat window so some of us can follow through? What you just mentioned about the the two separate keys for region based. Yeah, it's in terms of where you can restore the key, isn't it? That's, okay. You run into problems. So, yeah, I'm going to just quickly skip them. Essentially, what I wanted to show you here is that yep, you do not want to just go with one scope. If you are building an API, be a responsible developer. Create a set of uh, scopes that give give the IT administrator some some idea of uh, you know having controlled controlling access to you to the data that's held by your application. And if you are developing scopes, if you are sorry publishing scopes, yeah. So for these things stand that we'd have that challenge of of generating keys and then putting them across the two different environments. And I guess the other thing there is that in in terms of that whole separation of duties, because it's two copies of the same key. Mm -hmm. You can have two different people with with completely different access, but if they've both got access to the key, then you know the key is already known to both. Whereas by having two separate keys, then each person only knows one of those two keys. Thanks. So to continue on this discussion, so if you are publishing scopes, please, as a, one of the things that you should also consider is publishing an application permission. Uh, this is for developers who understand what it is, that it, yeah. what's different from delegated and app permissions. The app permissions are being requested more and more because it enables things like automation, microservices, and some areas. And 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 uh, your client uh, clients, your your basically the clients of your API will right. become quite frustrated. There is a good chance of them becoming frustrated if they only see delegated permissions and not app permissions. This is again something that uh, developers uh, or Microsoft product teams in the Graph API are learning slowly. Is that uh, it gives them no real advantage of just publishing delegated permissions because there is always somebody out there whom we basically end up disappointing if the equivalent uh, app permissions are not provided. Again, a quick walkthrough of uh, a token that is given to a web API. Uh, it's an access token, not an ID token. In this case, this is a token that was issued to a user in case you wanted to carry out extended token validation or look into more of these claims to make further business decisions. Remember this, uh, the audience has your app ID URI. The app ID is the calling client app ID. Maybe Thank you just you. want to restrict the call to just a few of these applications and not the whole world in general. Your scope claim has all the scopes that the, they have been consented to, and you should use the data provided here 
to basically drive business decisions or data access decisions. And again, use a standard token validation library. This is an access token again for a web API, but it's issued to an app. There is no user in front of it. Again, make sure it's the audience is right. Make sure that uh, if you want, if you care about the calling applications client ID, look at the app ID claim. And in this case, the app permissions are given to you in the roles claim. Just be aware of that. And uh, you want to basically drive your data access uh, decision based on uh, what's what's actually consented for. So this will only be available when, an, at least in this case, a tenant admin consents for them. Okay. I wanted to show some more on the Graph Explorer, but we are out of time. So, but uh, essentially, uh, I'll, I'll probably get back to it after I'm done with the last few slides here. Uh, this is a topic I will start. Uh, Quickly covering here. So again, I had discussed earlier as a developer, you have to start looking into that. Hey, my application can be breached. Am I really prepared for it? So in this case, how you want to go forward here is that you have put some policy, some thumb, some thought in the process, something that you have added to your app development lifecycle CI/CD that helps you recover quickly. So first of all, we have discussed it in quite a bit, support credential hygiene. Can your app actually deal with the credentials being rotated in the in the key vault? Uh, you want to allow IT to rotate credentials before you, without your help. You should use Key Vault and manage identities together, especially if you are, de you are deployed on Azure today. This really gets, gets you into a very safe place and, and helps with credential hygiene today. As I had mentioned, there is a demo out there that you can use uh, uh, get to by using the, the URL that I provided here, where you can see how that application that I had just shown you that we had used earlier for CAE that, that I had actually uh, provided a link to in the CAE section, uh, slowly moves its secret from the from the configuration file to Key Vault, and then basically deploys an Azure and uses managed identity to get that secret, completely getting rid of any secret in the web, web config. Uh, please do have a look; it's quite interesting, and it, it will get get you to a very safe place if once you have uh, completely ingested it into your development lifecycle. The next thing that I wanted you to look into and now that we have looked at all these tokens and all these claims is that if you log you know events in your application if you write telemetry in your authentication and authorization layer you should look at some of these specific claims that are available in the tokens that are given to you and you should write those you should consider writing those again it depends on uh, the privacy some of the organizations will have privacy settings that are there but you should consider writing some of these into your logs the reasons are that when the when somebody detects an attack or when an attack takes place or somebody is notified, the IT admin is notified of an attack or a breach and, and or on an exploit, this information is extremely useful to actually figure out where the attacker went, what are the things they did, what are the uh, places where they might have hurt the system or stole data from and things like that. It's really, really hard to figure out the extent of damage if this piece of information is not available in your application log. So think about how you can make use of it, how you can enhance your telemetry to include this pieces of information. Okay. So for example, if CAE, if you're supporting CAE, one of the great things that you benefit from is that once a, a, a Microsoft identity protection detects an attack or, or a compromised user, you will be uh, you 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 will not be able to really uh, this user's uh, graph tokens will not, for example, no longer be usable anymore. So that's one other for a, for a, for a Zoom breach. Uh, you should look into CAE again. As I mentioned that, you know, most of these, these steps that you take do not necessarily fall into just one of those principles. Moving forward, uh, again, the attackers necessarily don't always just steal data. They might actually change data. They might actually delete data. They might actually, you know, destroy or, or create problems for you. Do you really, have you really ever backed up and restored from your backup? Do you have those things in place or not is something that you should probably look into. Again, do not assume that your application or your data is 100% safe. Things happen, and when things happen, you would be thankful that you probably spent some time and very little amount of time that you have to put into uh, if you if you build a process to recover from backups and, and so on. Uh, if you have a lot of data that your application handles, Try to see if you can remove personally identified or sensible data in probably like I'm just you know giving you one hypothetical example in a different table or a different database have a have a different set of control mechanisms to encrypt and access those data. Uh, usually, if from a performance reason, if you are uh, 
doing this, it basically makes the attack or data stealing a little harder is because now the attacker has to compromise two sets of keys or, or access mechanisms to get to your sensitive data. Uh, isolate development resources and production. This is something that uh, I had a link for and I forgot here, but I should have put there, but Azure AD provides you uh, with a lot of free with free tenants. You can use the Microsoft 365 developer program to get fully loaded, fully licensed tenants that you can use for your development test testing. You do not need to test in your production environment. Again, that might not be applicable to uh, depending upon some of the organizational policies, but by default, you should be able to develop, test your applications in a separate tenant from your production. And if you are really, really careful about it, you should be able to build a CI CD process that gets your code once tested uh, in a in a test environment deployed to production by the uh, by the IT admins or the IT department alone without your help without much of much help from you so that's actually a good north star to look into uh, do look into getting uh, you know free Azure AD tenants and then basically using them for uh, your development purposes uh, stopping here because I we are actually done um, and I'll take some some more questions okay we have a question from Sahil. Uh, Zero trust is explicitly verified, but the rollback test you assume access without explicitly. No, not necessarily. So when you say the, the when when Azure AD sends you a token, you might be uh, you, the first thing you know is that the user is an authenticated user. Now you're using the roles to decide some operations. So maybe there is an admin portal on your web application and there is a user portal, or maybe there are certain things around approval processes, and you will use app roles for those. So uh, it helps you is because uh, you can basically build RBAC within your application. There are more benefits to it, and and I and those are covered again in the in the zero trust guide uh, with respect to when you use Appros. For example, there are there is a feature in um, Azure AD uh, called uh, privilege identity management. In those cases, an IT admin can simply pick up the app role, one of the uh, one or more of the app roles in your in your application, and they can drive a policy. On, on the Azure AD side themselves, like, hey, if somebody is assigned to this app role and is trying to sign in the application, they have to do you know two levels of MFA. There is no such thing as two levels of MFA, but I'm just making it up. But they can have another set of policies for uh, users who are assigned to a, a set of app roles that an application publishes. And uh, that's why we are encouraging developers to uh, use app roles wherever possible and to drive some of the authorization decisions. Okay, uh, these are some of the developer resources that we have available for you. I know I, we dropped in a lot of these links, but uh, uh, there is some out there again, okay, and, and you can uh, again start from the the primary guide, uh, the first the developer guide, which is a con which has consolidated list of all of these links that you saw here. Uh, we will also make the the deck available to you, and you should be able to find some pieces of information. Happy to continue chatting with you on the in the chat here, and. Oh, I see one more question. Is there any guidance for attributes based security? Uh, it's actually a good example that you brought up, Ishmael. So attributes, are, if, if you're referring to the ABAC that we have recently, I think previewed or GA'd, uh, this, is, this is again something that an IT admin basically uses to drive a bunch of RBAC decisions. But if you cared about those, they will actually sh some of the claims in your token will be driven by how these policies uh, the ABAC policies are basically provided so if you remember i had mentioned that things like groups not just groups but uh, azure azure ad roles also show up in tokens so there are parts and pieces that that might be useful depending you know uh, th there would be some decision making that might be affected uh, uh, by by uh, those those claims being available i'm sorry i don't have a very detailed answer it's, it's a feature that i need to look into deeper but yes, uh, the Azure AD roles and some of the features that drive features on Azure uh, might be affected by those. I'm not sure the extent to which a developer should worry about at this stage. They really should be concerned about, but uh, hopefully I'll have a detailed answer in, in the next next series that we cover on this topic. Great, uh, thank you everybody uh, for being showing up in this uh, session again. Uh, you have a great rest of this day and the year and uh, happy holidays. We'll be available for you for the next session on January 20th. Thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone for attending today and thank you for being so engaging. Uh, Ari had his hand up uh, earlier. So Ari, I don't know if you want to say anything last minute comment or. No, I just want to make sure Kalyan covered Sahil's question about zero trust in RBAC. So I think he answered that question.
Okay. So thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great day. And see you January 20th is the next call. Thank you.